Good afternoon, and welcome to the Dean's Public Engagement Lecture Series. Um, I welcome you also on behalf of Dean Amar. Uh, I know he was very much wishes that he could have been with us here today. Increasing interaction among the legal academy, the legal and business professions, and the public is critically important. And law schools like ours have a role to play in bringing these together. Through the Dean's Public Engagement Lecture Series, we host distinguished judges, lawyers, public officials, business people, and entrepreneurs who can give us different perspectives on cutting edge issues affecting law, justice, business, and government. We're all participants, so students, professors, distinguished speakers, everyone here today, um, in a conversation about the law and in action, building and supporting and sometimes changing our legal system. And lectures like this are a key part of participating together in this. Today, I'm honored to introduce Illinois Supreme Court Justice Michael Burke. Justice Burke was born in Chicago and attended Northern Illinois University and the John Marshall Law School. Before becoming a judge, he was a, an assistant state's attorney in DuPage County for almost a decade. His judicial career began when he was appointed to the bench in 1992, where he first served as associate judge of the 18th Judicial Circuit. In 2001, he was appointed as a circuit judge and won election in 2002 and retention in 2008. While in the circuit court, he heard felony cases and sat as the presiding judge of the misdemeanor and traffic division. In July 2008, Justice Burke was assigned to the appellate court, and in 2014, he was elected to that court. He has an active role in judicial committees, including service as committee chair of the Judicial Performance Evaluation Committee. He was also a member of several other Illinois Supreme Court committees, including the Judicial Conference of Illinois, Study Committee on Complex Litigation, Courtroom Security Committee, and Judicial Mentor Committee. When describing the career of such a distinguished speaker, inevitably, uh, many accomplishments get left out. We're here, after all, to hear him speak. Um, but I'll just mention that one noticeable theme in his many activities is his role in educating and mentoring new judges. Justice Burke is a certified new judge mentor and peer judge mentor and has served on the faculties of the Judicial Education Conference and New Judge Seminar. In March uh, 2020, Justice Burke joined the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, please join me in welcoming Justice Burke to the College of Law. Well, thank you, Dean, for that, that wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, Professor Scott Salos here, who uh, invited me to come and speak to his class today. Um, he had a bunch of tough questions for me, so I'm a little wrung out right now. Um, hopefully, I can make it through this lecture. But uh, and, and, it, and it's not going to be a lecture. Um, also, I want to thank I want to publicly uh, thank uh, Professor Zala for uh, his tireless efforts um, on Supreme Court committees. Uh, he is a favorite of the Supreme Court. He keeps getting appointed to committee after committee. Um, we first met when he was uh, serving on the Judicial Performance Evaluation Committee uh, that I was serving on and then I ultimately became chair of. But uh, um, he's involved in so many other things. And, and again, I want to thank you so much for your service to the court uh, here in Illinois. Uh, as I said, I really don't want this to be too much of a lecture. Uh, I thought if I lectured you uh, I have this memory going back to when I was trying a, a deceptive practice case as a prosecutor, and I was looking at the jury, I was, I was giving an impassioned, you know, as much as you can on a deceptive practice case, forgery case, you know, giving an impassioned closing argument to the jury, and uh, I can't really do, give it justice with this mask on, but there's a woman in the front row, and she's looking at me, and lets out the biggest yawn, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I've lost her. Uh, and I, we did lose the case, so, well, you know, I guess I, I guess I did lose it. Um, but I didn't want this to be too much of a lecture and put you to sleep, so I apologize for the somewhat eclectic nature of, of this talk, because I'm going to talk about a little bit about federalism, uh, and again, I'm going to scratch the surface on a lot of these issues that you could go way more in-depth on uh, on your own. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the appellate court and the Supreme Court. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, some brief writing tips and oral argument tips. Um, so it's, it's, again, a bit of an eclectic thing, but I figured if I bounced around a little bit, maybe you'd stay awake. I don't know, uh, hopefully. Um, we're going to talk, start talking about federalism and the court. Uh, federalism is generally a system of government where the same territory uh, is controlled by two levels of government. Um, in the court system, it's really the interplay between the federal court and the state court, and between federal law and state law, when that law is being applied in a different court. Um, federal, court federal courts uh, often apply um, state law in a number of situations, especially when they're um, undertaking diversity jurisdiction. And of course, state courts apply federal law in a number of different situations um, when, that, when the state law is preempted by the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution. But what I really wanted to talk about today was what's called the new judicial federalism, which is the willingness of state courts to base, to base protection of individual rights on state constitutional grounds and not federal constitutional grounds as defined by the United States Supreme Court. You know, this actually gained traction uh, during the shift between the Warren Court and the Burger Court. You know, under the Warren Court, the, uh, the Supreme Court found, you know, many constitutional protections in the U.S. Constitution, which were somewhat eroded by the Burger Court. And while that erosion was taking place, you had liberal justices such as Justice William Brennan and some others uh, who were exhorting uh, Supreme Courts from uh, the states to, you know, look at their constitutions to determine individual rights. Um, you know, in Illinois, the Illinois Supreme Court has, has of course, the ultimate authority over the state constitution. Um, and there's an overriding principle that's involved here, and that is that the state constitution may confer greater rights um, on an individual or for an individual um, than the U.S. Constitution, but it may never, you know, confer lesser rights uh, than the federal constitution. Now, you may have a provision in the Illinois Constitution uh, that's, or, that's totally separate from the, federal for, from the federal constitution. For instance, the single subject rule uh, is something where the Illinois legislature has to pass legislation that's involving just a single subject. And if, if there are more than one subjects involved in, in one piece of legislation, it gets tossed out on state constitutional grounds. And that finds no counterpart in the federal constitution. So we have a situation there where it's just one um, you know, thing in the state constitution that we don't see in the federal. Now, when rights are secured by both the state and the federal constitution, um, we have three basic ways or approaches that a state can go. One is total lockstep with the US Supreme Court on the way they handle that constitutional issue. The other extreme is to always interpret the right under the state constitution. And now you would, if you did that, if the states that do that could certainly look at the federal or US Supreme Court cases uh, as persuasive authority, but not as controlling authority. So uh, this, that's the second extreme, but the, the vast majority of states find a middle ground, or you know, some uh, commentators call it the interstitial approach. But in Illinois, We've actually crafted our own type of interstitial approach, which is called limited lockstep. Uh, under this approach, we construe the provision in lockstep with its federal counterpart unless we find a basis to depart from lockstep. You know, one basis is something that we find maybe in the language of our Constitution. An example of this is um, the Constitution, the Illinois Constitution, used to have a, a provision in the Confrontation Clause. Of course, the Confrontation Clause is you have the right to confront the witnesses against you in court. And there was a provision in the Illinois Constitution that said that there had to be face-to-face -face confrontation. Um, this, of course, was not found in the federal Constitution anywhere. And in 1994, in People v. Fitzpatrick, the Illinois Supreme Court was called upon to look at a, a statute that was passed that allowed um, child sexual abuse victims to testify in court via closed circuit TV. And the Illinois Supreme Court threw out that statute as a violation of the Illinois Confrontation Clause, even though finding that it probably would have passed constitutional muster under U.S. Constitution. Uh, under US Constitution. So, uh, and I will note that since then, Illinois has 
remove that face-to-face -face language from the Constitution, so we do have laws that allow for this type of, of testimony now. But that's an example of where there's something in the Constitution that we can look to that says this should be treated differently than the federal counterpart. Other bases to depart from lockstep would be uh, something in either our constitutional debates or our committee reports that indicates an intent to construe a provision differently. Um, or if Illinois has some long-standing values and traditions which allow for a departure. Uh, now this last sentence that I just read uh, is somewhat undefined, is somewhat nebulous, um, and has, has led some commentators to opine that our jurisprudence on this is confusing uh, and allows the court on an ad hoc and result-oriented basis to stray from the Constitution, to stray from the federal Constitution and to not to stray from it, but to impose um, what we believe the Illinois Constitution should say about a particular issue. You know, I'm not going to really comment on what commentators say. Um, the only thing I will do is agree that our path to limited lockstep, uh, as found in the case of People versus Cabalas, uh, has been somewhat tortuous. Um, I recommend, if you are interested more in this concept of judicial federalism, um, that you first start by reading People versus Cabalas. Uh, I think it does clarify some things, uh, not everything. Uh, and then really we just have to wait and see what other cases come, come down the pike on this issue. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the appellate court uh, and then the Supreme Court and some of the procedures and things that we do there. Uh, in the appellate court, the main thing that you have to realize about the appellate court is that parties have the absolute right to appeal an adverse judgment against them. What that means is that the appellate court is the court of last review of the vast majority of cases in the state court here in Illinois. Uh, appellate jurisdiction is limited to reviewing final orders unless one of the exceptions for reviewing interlocutory orders under Supreme Court rules applies. You know, a final order is one that fixes the judgments of, fixes the rights of the parties and nothing remains but to execute the judgment. So some examples. If you have an order dismissing all the counts of a complaint with prejudice, of course, that's a final order. It can be appealed. If you have an order denying a motion to dismiss, the case goes on, it's not a final order. Those are simple. Where we get more complicated with appellate jurisdiction is when we talk about an order dismissing some parties and not other parties, some claims and not other claims, uh, you know, when is that right for appeal? Now, if that happens and the trial court certifies under Supreme Court Rule 304A that there's no just cause to um, delay enforcement or appeal, then that's automatically or, or can be immediately or has to be immediately appealed, actually, that that uh, decision dis or you know, disposing of that claim or that party. Um, you know, Appellate jurisdiction, I could talk about that for hours and you definitely would fall asleep. Um, it's a labyrinth that, uh, that if you get caught in the middle of, sometimes you get a little lost. Uh, the only thing I can say is <clears throat> we have a, an expert on appellate jurisdiction in the second district who, um, his name is Jeff, Jeff Kaplan, he's now the clerk, and he will give seminars on this topic. And I was on the appellate court for 12 years. I've now been on the Supreme Court for over a year and a half. And he, whenever he gives a seminar, I learn something new because it, there's just so many little twists and turns. So if any of you are studying appellate jurisdiction right now, God bless you. Um, <laughs> you know, cases in the appellate court are heard in three judge panels, or I'm sorry, yeah, in, in a panel of three judges. And the decisions are, are issued in opinions and in what are called Rule 23 orders, basically. Now, I do want to touch on one thing, because on January 1st of 2021, our court changed Rule 23, which is the, the rule that sets out you know, opinions and um, Rule 23 orders. Um, previous, uh, the previous iteration of Rule 23 said that Rule 23 orders could not be cited as precedential uh, by parties in any circumstance. You know, we were lobbied by several uh, bar groups, including the Illinois State Bar Association, for years, um, you know, uh, to, to change this rule. I remember when I ran for the appellate court in 2014, 
and I had my interview with the State Bar Association. They were asking me about my position on Rule 23 at that time, and it was going on even before that. So various bar, bar groups have been lobbying for a change to this rule um, for a number of years. Now, let me tell you the reason behind the rule. When the rule was first enacted, uh, we had this thing, um, I don't know, maybe you, some of you remember called these things called books. Do you remember books? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you know, we, we were talking before we came in here today, and it, I was talking to Professor Zala's class. No one had a book out. I mean, not a, everyone's typing away. And, wow, every, I mean, everything is on the computer. But when we had books, these opinions were published in the books, and people had to buy the books. And the only people that were happy were like West and some of these other publishing companies because all the lawyers' offices had to buy the books, the libraries at the law schools and, and everywhere else had to buy the books, judges' chambers had to buy the books, and they were very expensive. So if you think about it, you have the, a matter of appeal by right in an appellate case. So every frivolous appeal you know, that has to have some disposition to it, there has to be some order written, and every one of those orders is going to go into a book, and everyone's going to have to buy these books. It made no sense. So there's a real reason for Rule 23 at the time, and that was to have precedential opinions, opinions that changed or modified the law, you know, available um, in the books for people to look at. But the other stuff, you know, not precedential, nobody had to look at it. And nobody did look at it. They weren't available to anybody. But now with the advent of the computer, of course, the books are gone, and all the Rule 23 opinions started being published on there. And so you had a number of lawyers appearing in court with these, you know, these Rule 23 orders that were similar to their case that they wanted to cite, and they couldn't. The rule, you know, foreclosed that. So we did accede to the demands of the bar associations, and we changed the rule. So any Rule 23 opinion or, or order that's published after January 1st, 2021 may now be used as persuasive authority in court. And I think it's a good change to the rule as it relates to the trial courts. Because now we have attorneys who see a Rule 23 order that's similar factually to their case. They can show the court that. You have courts that can rely on, on those Rule 23 orders um, as persuasive authority in the case that, that's being decided. I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but it didn't make a whole lot of sense as it related to the, the change in the rule as it related to the appellate court. Because if you think about it, in Illinois, we have what's called vertical stare decisis. The Supreme Court says something, everything, everybody has to follow. The appellate court says something, the trial courts have to follow. But we do not have horizontal stare decisis as they do in the federal system, as they do in some other states like Wisconsin where the intermediate appellate court, where opinions are precedential on every other intermediate appellate court. We don't have that in Illinois. In Illinois, what we have is that every appellate court can rule on a case however they want to rule on the case, no matter what another appellate court has said, which is why we have so many conflicts in the districts and different areas of the law. Um, so realistically, opinions in the appellate court are only persuasive. So to now say that Rule 23s are persuasive, and then in the appellate court, realistically, opinions were only persuasive, didn't make a lot of sense. But again, that's getting a little far into the weeds. Not many people really think about that, and I think it is a good change to the rule as it relates to the trial courts. But just so you're aware of that, when you're citing things in Illinois courts, you can cite Rule 23 orders as persuasive authority. Um, I'll shift gears and talk about the Supreme Court a little bit. You know, there are seven justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, the Constitution says three of those justices are elected from Cook County. And then the other four justices are elected from geographic areas um, throughout the state. This past spring, the legislature uh, redistricted the Illinois Supreme Court. What that means is I was appointed in the old second district, which was the 13 counties of Northern Illinois. And it was very symmetrical because you look at the second district was Northern Illinois, and then the next layer of counties in the state was the third, and then the fourth, and then, and then the fifth. And, and we're sitting in the fourth right now, the old fourth. I think it's still the fourth, I'm not even sure. Um, but you know, when, when, when they changed this, they made it where the new second district is five counties that were in the old second district, but that's it. Not, they took, you know, there were 13 in the old second district. 
And then the new third district includes DuPage County, where I live, along with Will, Kankakee, Iroquois, Grundy, LaSalle, and Bureau. So there's seven counties in the new third district, and that's the district that I have to run when I'm running for a full tenure term on the court. Um, so, you know, the legislature did this, and, and realistically, it's, you know, fair, fair in compliance with the Constitution. The Constitution says that these districts are supposed to be of substantially similar population. And the way it was before, in my district, there were about 3.2 million people. And in the third district, there were 1.9 million people. And in the downstate districts, there was like 1.3, 1.4 million people. So the way it was before, you know, my district was huge as far as population goes. So the redistricting, which has not been challenged in court, um, basically brings, if you look at the populations of the different districts, it is somewhat in line, um, they are in line with each other. You know, the Supreme Court wasn't always seven justices. Um, under our first constitution, there were four justices who were appointed by the legislature. Now, you've probably heard and read about and studied about court packing, you know, the issue of court packing under FDR, which is now, you know, somewhat the topical uh, discussion, at least up to a couple months ago, I suppose. Um, we had our own little brush with court packing in Illinois. Um, in 1841, you know, again, the legislature could appoint justices. So in 1841, the Supreme Court rendered a decision in a case that the Democrat-controlled legislature didn't like. So the legislature then increased the size of the Supreme Court from four justices to nine. And then the Democrat-controlled legislature put five Democrat judges on the bench in order to ensure, apparently ensure, um, good results in the future. Um, it's interesting because one of those five justices is someone that you may have heard of, Stephen Douglas. So Stephen Douglas was on the court from 1841 to 1843 when he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and ultimately Senate and, you know, Senate after the Lincoln-Douglas debates and, and uh, up to today's fame of having his statue taken down in the, in the in Springfield. So but he was on the Supreme Court um, for two years back in the 1840s. That experiment didn't really last too long. Um, in 1848, under the second Illinois Constitution, I changed the justices to three, three justices, and they were elected from geographic districts. There was a northern district, a central district, and a southern district. Um, and it's interesting because Illinois is really, I think, it may be the only state, I should probably look this up, but it may be the only state that elects justices from geographic districts. You know, many states appoint their justices, and the ones that are elected are elected statewide. But we've kept this uh, geographic district um, you know, all the way through all of our constitutions from the second constitution all the way down to our latest constitution from 1970. You know, there are a number of cases that come directly to the Supreme Court. I'm sorry, there are a few cases that come directly to the Supreme Court. Back in the day when there was, the death penalty was, was in, you know, um, people were eligible for the death penalty in Illinois, if a trial court imposed death on a defendant, that case came directly to the Supreme Court. The, the, probably the largest area of uh, direct files that we get are where a trial court finds a statute unconstitutional, unconstitutional or invalid. But the vast majority of cases come to the court by way of what's called petition for leave to appeal. Um, and we only take between, on any given term, four to nine or 10 percent of the petitions that are filed. So again, you have this appeal of right in the appellate court. If you lose in the appellate court, you file your PLA. And out of all those PLAs that are filed, we only take around four, you know, four to nine percent or so. Um, so again, the appellate courts are the, the courts of last resort uh, for, for the vast majority of cases. Now, what are we looking for when we're deciding whether to take it? It's a big part of our job is deciding what cases we're going to take. Um, and I will say that, that my point person on PLAs is here. Um, John Warner is one of my elbow clerks. And John is a proud graduate of U of I undergrad and a proud graduate of U of I law school. So. Um, He's my, he's my PLA point guy, so um, he probably could be giving this talk more better than me on PLAs. But uh, what we look for, um, 
you know, is, is there a conflict between the districts? So I told you about this um, horizontal start, start of the census. We don't have it. So that results in a lot of conflicts between the districts. You know, if we had horizontal stare decisis, one district would have to look at the decision of another district, and if they didn't like it, they'd still have to follow it unless they found it to be palpably erroneous. Well, now they just don't, if they don't like it, they don't follow it. And so we get a number of cases on the Supreme Court where there are conflicts in the districts. Otherwise, what we're looking for is basically the general importance of an issue. Um, you know, will the decision impact people other than the parties in this case? Uh, is there something where we feel that the uh, appellate or trial courts need guidance on? You know, I'm going to just address a couple of misconceptions. First of all, whether the appellate court got it right, right or wrong is not really a huge you know, point of contention with us on PLAs. Um, you know, if we, if we on the court, or several of the justices on the court, may have decided the case differently, but it's a case where we're simply applying the facts of that particular case to settled law in an area, we probably don't take that case. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't vote to take that case, even though I may have voted, you know, ruled differently in the appellate court. Um, you know, the, the other thing is, um, you know, case, cases of first impression. You know, people think, oh, it's a case of first impression in Illinois, so I'm sure the Supreme Court is gonna take it. Well, we don't generally, we don't, often take those cases. What I look at, personally, in those cases of first impression is, was the appellate court analysis sound? Because, again, we have a unified court system in Illinois. What that means is, if we have a case of first impression from one appellate court, that means all the trial courts in the state have to follow that until another appellate court rules on it. So all the trial courts in the state have to follow that. So if, it's, if there's a, a, you know, the analysis is somehow flawed in my mind, then I would vote to take that case. But if the analysis I, I feel is sound, um, I'm probably not gonna take that case. I'm probably gonna wait to see if a conflict does in fact arise. And then when, if a conflict arises, what do we have on the Supreme Court? We're gonna take that case, of course. And what we have on the Supreme Court then is a case saying one thing, a case saying the opposite. We have two hopefully cogent analyses to look at, um, and it's going to make our decision better. I mean, and that's the way I look at it. You know, I, and I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for you know, the entire court. You know, in the Supreme Court, we've had uh, several big issues to deal with lately. Uh, the big issue that we're all dealing with for the last year and a half and why we're all stand, sitting here wearing masks is COVID, of course. Um, you know, I can tell you, I was sworn into the Supreme Court on March 1st of 20. I went to my first term on March 9th of 20. And on March 17th of 20, we shut down the entire court system. <laughs> my name is on that order, shutting every courthouse in the state of Illinois to the public other than for essential matters. Think of that. You know, I mean, we're supposed to have an open court system. That was basically our first COVID order was to shut everything down. Um, we did immediately then begin putting in place procedures and resources to begin remote proceedings. And over time, we monitored the resumption of in-person proceedings in the courthouses. And I'm happy to say that most of them are up and running pretty, uh, pretty normally right now. Um, and, but we did enter a number of COVID-related orders. And probably the most significant order we entered, other than closing the court system to the public, was we suspended the statutory speedy trial rights of every criminal defendant in the state of Illinois. We just, by order, did it. Well, you know. It reminds me a little bit of you know, Abraham Lincoln suspending habeas corpus during the Civil War. Um, I mean, it was, it's monumental. It's absolutely monumental. Um, and it didn't happen you know, without great thought and consternation. But the thing is, if you don't have jurors coming into the courthouse, how are you going to try cases? You know? so we don't have trial by battle anymore. I don't think we can do that. So um, you know, we're going to have so many things on our plate and on our docket for years to come related to COVID. Uh, certainly, you know, we're going to see throughout, you know, percolating up to the Supreme Court challenges to the speedy trial order. And I'm not going to comment on the merits of any of these issues, but just to say that these are things that we have to look forward to on the court. Challenges to our speedy trial order, challenges to the governor's emergency orders and emergency powers, uh, challenges to vaccine and mask mandates, challenges to forced quarantines, Challenges to limitations placed on the right to assemble. Uh, you know, these things are going to all come, or I'm guessing, come before us at some point in time. Um, and 
you know, it's going to keep us busy for years to come with COVID. A couple other very important developments that we've had uh, over the last uh, year and a half that I, since I've been on the court. On June 22 of 2020, we issued, um, you know, I think a, a fairly stunning statement on racial justice. Um, as a Supreme Court, we issued that statement. Um, you know, we had done things, or the court had done things in the past in this area. We formed a commission or a committee on equality, and we, you know, we had been looking into some of the areas that are raised uh, and issues that are raised. Um, but you know, if you haven't read our statement on racial justice, I suggest you do. Um, but as part of our response to everything that was happening last, last year, uh, we became one of a handful of states to hire a state court chief diversity and inclusion officer. Um, she's a wonderful woman who has hit the ground running um, and is there to, going to assist us, I think, greatly in responding to uh, a number of these issues. Also, in the spring, the legislature passed the Safety Act. I'm sure many of you have read about that, which, among other things, beginning in 2023, eliminates cash bail in Illinois. So there's a big thing on our plate right now is setting up a statewide pretrial services system for handling um, these issues. You know, we have to have um, great assessment instruments for our trial court judges who are sitting in bond court. who are gonna have to make a decision of who stays in jail while awaiting trial and who's out of jail while awaiting, while awaiting trial. Um, and, and we're in the process of setting those, those procedures up. And also setting up a system to monitor and supervise those defendants that are, are actually released into the community. Um, it's a huge undertaking. Um, we have public hearings going on. We have a task force that's working on it. Um, but, um, you know, we're going to come up with the best plan that we possibly can, uh, and at least in my mind, with an eye toward ensuring public safety. So as you can see, um, the Supreme Court's plate, as usual, is very full. Um, I, I do want to talk, I know a number of you have to write briefs, and, and you're coming up on, on that, that time of the semester where it's time to write a brief. Um, so I, I want to just talk a little bit about brief writing, a little bit about oral arguments, if you have to do that in your advanced appellate advocacy classes or in court. If you're doing a brief in Illinois, the best place to start is Supreme Court Rule 341. There is a section in the rule, 341H, on every section of the brief. And it gives you examples of how to write certain things, examples of how to write an issue statement, examples of the nature of the case. You know, take a look at that. Um, because at least if you're going to file a brief in Illinois, you know, and I can tell you as, as a reviewing court justice for many years now, the, ones that, the, the briefs that don't comply with the rules drive you crazy. You know, the nature of the case is supposed to be one paragraph and has certain things that are supposed to be in it. You can't imagine how many times you open the nature of the case, and there's like three or four pages. And you're like, nature of the case, four pages, you know? And everything is then repeated later in the case, later in the brief. I mean, follow the rule. I mean, the rule, we, we always say, the rules aren't suggestions, they're rules for a reason, so follow the rules. This seems probably rudimentary, but if you do a good outline of your argument, that sets up your points and authorities. And then you go from there. Um, <laughs> Don't ever bury a point that you want to make in the text of the brief. And what I mean by that is make it a point or a heading or a subpoint or a heading. Because I have to respond to all of your arguments. Okay? And if I don't, I'm going to get a petition for rehearing from you saying you didn't address my argument on X, Y, and Z. The easiest way for me to respond to those arguments is to, to, make, to see that there's a point or a sub-point, you know, that, that's, and, then, and then you explain what you're talking about in there. Um, you know, an, an example of this is recently we had a case where um, someone was trying to throw out a defendant's statement based upon the violation of a Supreme Court rule. And buried in the text, there was an allusion to the fact that the statement was involuntary. So I was talking to my clerk, I said, are they raising a voluntariness? I don't know. You know, we didn't address it, and then we didn't get a PFR on it, so I guess they weren't. I don't even know. But don't allude to other arguments in the middle of an argument that you're making on the rule or whatever that case may be. So don't, I guess my, it's one of my pet peeves, don't bury something in there. You're going you're gonna, to, 
I, hopefully, I think we did some, some handouts. And the two handouts that, that um, you're going to get, I think, and if not, we can make it available on the, um, we can make it available by computer, um, is a handout of suggestions from the second district. We had an appellate lawyers association luncheon where we all got together, and we, the nine of us in the second district at the time, we put together kind of a, we, we at first called it a pet peeves list. Um, and then we thought that might not make people too happy, so we called it a suggestions list or something like that. Um, so you should be getting that. And then also an outline of a, of a, a presentation I gave on writing briefs um, several years ago. So uh, that hopefully would be somewhat helpful. But um, you have to have a standard of review for each issue. Standard of review is important. Um, you know, Southern Illinois University Law School had a, a law review article that came out several years after this was made part of the rules and you had to include a standard of review. And the question raised in there was, are standards of review important? Do they make a difference in the case? The answer is yes. Yes, they do. I mean, there's a big difference between abuse of discretion and de novo review. Um, so please, put the standard. Sometimes the standard review review is the issue in the case. Um, so every, every issue has to have a standard of review. A clear statement of jurisdiction, especially in an appellate court brief. You know, by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, we pretty much assume you have jurisdiction, but, or we have jurisdiction, but in the appellate court, the first thing that we're trained to look for is jurisdiction because it's real easy to write a summary order of two pages saying why there's no jurisdiction as opposed to addressing your 10 issues in your brief. So a statement of jurisdiction setting forth the reasons why we have jurisdiction and the dates and a citation record for uh, all those orders and things. Um, statement of facts. You're probably, if you're going through appellate advocacy now, your teacher is probably telling you to write a persuasive statement of facts. Well, first of all, that doesn't mean leaving out facts that hurt you. Okay? <laughs> persuasive. That isn't persuasive. Right? In fact, it's persuasive the other way. Because think of all the people who are going to read the record. You know, on the appellate court, you have three justices. You have your opponent and your opponent's law firm. You have, you know, the three justices, you have a myriad law clerks for the three justices. We're all going to be reading the record, and the Supreme Court is seven. Um, so if you bury a fact or you forget about a fact that hurts you, that, that's going to tell a lot um, about your, you know, your argument. Um, also, it, it, it means not to argue your case in the statement of facts. Persuasive doesn't mean arguing your case, okay, because you're going to get a motion to, to uh, strike your statement of facts from the other side if it's argumentative. Um, you know, the, when you get to your argument, number one, make sure that the cases that you're citing stand for the propositions that you're actually saying they stand for. So many times you read a, uh, you know, you, you read the brief and, you, and then you, and you, we pull the cases, we, we read the cases, and the case doesn't say what it says. And then you, a lot of times you can see where the person got it from. They got it from copying a head note, okay, or they got it from copying what another case said that case said. But it doesn't say it. You know, it, it, you know and appellate courts and, and courts of review are, are, are terrible at this. We keep perpetuating this, you know. Read the case that you're citing for the proposition that you're citing it for. And the quickest way to lose credibility is to have some, you know, to say something says that it doesn't actually say. Um, your argument should really read the way you want our opinion to read, you know. A statement of the issue, the relevant law, applying the issue to the facts, um, and then what our decision should be. Um, so really, as you're writing your, your, your argument section, write it the way you would want us to write the opinion in your favor. Um, the conclusion should be brief, and it should state the relief sought. Um, let me tell you a horror story, okay? Appellant... Uh, there was a, a contract case, and there was a um, plaintiff sued a defendant. The defendant loses a trial, goes to the appellate court, says, in, in his conclusion, the attorney writes, reverse this case. So we on the appellate court looked at it, and we said, yes, you're right. Case reversed, and we sent it back. Well, guess what? There was a fee-shifting provision in the contract, which means that they would get all their attorney's fees because they won the case that was brought against them. So they go back to, this, to the trial court and they say, you know, we'd like our attorney's fees. And the trial judge said, the appellate court didn't send it back for that. Goodbye. And they appealed that ruling and we said, you're right. 
We reversed the case. You didn't ask us to remand it to the trial court for any further proceedings. It was over. It was done. Um, and, and of course, the time had passed for filing a petition for, for rehearing. So again, make sure you ask in the conclusion what for what you want. Um, and then a couple very quick things. Footnotes, you know, please, please <laughs> stop with the footnotes. You're killing us. And, and the same thing with block quotes. You know, if you block quote like a whole page of your brief from a case, that's an insult to me. And the reason it's an insult to me is because you're telling me I don't trust you to read the case. Well, I'm going to read the case. If you tell me this case is important, and it's important enough to put the black quote in, no, you can put quotes in from cases, don't get me wrong. But a, a single spaced black quote of almost an entire page, you know, you're not helping yourself. Okay? So explain why that case is important. Tell me in your words why that case is important. Don't just, you know, spit the case back at me, which I can look up on the computer and read myself. And finally, oral argument. I got a few minutes here. Um, know your case inside and out. My goal whenever I go to oral argument, I'm going to tell you, my goal when I walk in there is to know your case better than you do. That's my goal. I should never succeed at my goal. Ever. You should know that case. You've been living with that case. Last term, we did 24 oral arguments in the Supreme Court. There's no way I know 24 cases better than each individual attorney who's only working on one case. All right? But when you go into it, know your case better than anybody in the world. Know the facts. Know the key case law. You know, know the, the cases your, your opponent's citing and be able to um, distinguish them. Check for new cases since the brief were filed. That's, that's a given. Um, you know, just shepherdize everything. It's super simple now. Um, us old timers can remember when shepherd, shepherdizing something meant pulling out the book, the supplement, you know, the, 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 you know, you have to look at five five books to shepherdize one case. You guys got it made. You know, you know, it's not, there's no excuse. Um, be prepared at oral argument to be derailed. You're going to be derailed um, unless the justices just sit there and look at you and you give your whole spiel and then you sit down. That's probably not going to happen. You're going to be derailed. So how do you, how do you how do you prepare for that? Well, first of all, always when you get interrupted, always know where you were, and second of all identify some key points in your case, you know, some key areas that you definitely want to hit home. And let's say at the end of the argument, you have a minute left and, and, and you know, you want to have a, a short, forceful summary of those key points that you can get back into and end your argument on a high note with those, with those key points. Um, you know, craft a good opening sentence or two. Start with your strongest argument. Um, don't read the argument if possible. Uh, try to... Um, only give me the facts necessary. Again, give me some credit. I read the record. I read the, the briefs. Give me some credit, um, so you don't have to, you know, spit all the facts back at me. Um, but perhaps the most critical part of oral argument is responding to questions. Um, you have to prepare for this. Do a mock oral argument. You have to sit down with your brief, your opponent's brief. Look at the all the cases that are filed that you are know, cited by everybody. Be prepared to talk about them, distinguish them. You know. Whatever, you know, we talked about bad facts. Be prepared to talk about those bad facts and say why they don't matter to the outcome of the case. Um, go through your mind every question that could possibly be asked, and guess what? You'll be asked questions that you didn't remember, that you didn't think. Okay? Um, a lot of times, judges will ask questions that you just don't know what they're asking. <laughs> you know? I sat on a panel with, I'm not going to talk about the justices, but one justice asked a question that went on for maybe five minutes, the question. And by the end, the attorney was, the eyes were, <laughs> and then the justice sitting next to the other justice said, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> so, but if you don't understand the question, just say it. Say, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And, and the, the court will rephrase it. You know, um, if, you, if, you, if you don't know an answer, say you don't know. You know don't make something up. If, if, if a, the court asks you a question that's outside the record, Say it's outside the record. If you know the answer, you can answer it. But you should also say, that's not in the record. It's not, you know, what happened to, to this? You know, some judges might ask what happened to a certain person at a certain time. It's not in the record. Say, so judge, that's not in the record, but I will say that this is what happened. Um, if they're asking, give them the answer. And then don't argue with the court, please. Um, the court isn't arguing with you. 
you know, at, at the last term, I had an attorney. I asked the question. I had an attorney say, well, Judge, I know what you're arguing. And I said, no, no, I'm not arguing anything. I'm not arguing your opponent's case. I'm asking you a question. I want to know the answer to that question. You're not going to get questions that are softball questions about the strength of your case. You know, so if I ask you a question, it's probably going to be a pointed question about a weakness or a case that goes against you or something of that nature. Okay? Don't, I'm not arguing with you. I'm asking you a question. Don't argue back at me. Okay? You're not going to win the argument. That's just the way it works. You're not going to win. Okay? Uh, and then the last question is, does oral argument change the outcome or change your mind? I get that question a lot. The answer is yes. Yes, it does. Um, a good oral argument. We go in the back um, and we start talking about the case amongst, amongst ourselves, the justices, and um, a good oral argument and points made at that argument definitely can sway a case uh, one way or the other. So, um, I do want to take questions. I think I have some time to do that. So I would love to take questions.